Okay. <clears throat> so while we're waiting for a couple of other people to sign on, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Barbara Galazzo. I am the um, uh, exhibitions director at ROCA and I curated Miss um, Collette's exhibit. Um, and tonight she'll be talking about her, her photos in the exhibit. We're just waiting for a couple more people to sign on. So. So if you're just coming on, um, you might want to mute yourself so we don't hear all the background noise wherever you are. So I don't know what time it is now. Should we get started? Yeah, it's, a, it's 7 05. Oh, okay. It's so, okay. So I'm going to introduce. So Colette is uh, presently. Um, exhibiting at ROCA, and it's See, Observe, Think, Reflect, and Internalize is the name of her exhibition. And if you haven't seen it, you should get there and see it because it looks fantastic. Um, and it's about her journey, searching for her roots. She's been all over the world and um, it's a beautiful exhibition. So you should really see it. Uh, Colette, um, has been shown in galleries in New York City, New Jersey, Texas, Rochester, Buffalo, Toronto, Canada, and the USSR. Um, her works are in the photographic collections of Infoco, uh, the Smithsonian Institute's National African American Museum Project, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, Women in Photography International Archive, the Photography Collections Preservation Project in New York City, and in private collections. She's been an adjunct professor at um, Rockland Community College since 1992. And she has works featured in Deborah Willis Thomas's Black Photographers book, um, an illustrated bio bibliography and reflections in Black uh, history of Black photographers. Um, she's been in Emerge Magazine and in African Visions. Her works were included in Committed to the Image Contemporary Black Photographers at the Brooklyn Museum in 2001, PCPP Photography Collections Preservation Project in New York City, and Black New York Photographers of the 20th Century at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black History. Uh, in 2001, and 1999, she was awarded the National Council for Marketing and Public Relations Medallion Awards for print advertisement series through Campus Communications at SUNY Rockland. And she is a member of Kamoinge, which I don't, I didn't know about this organization. So I'm just gonna explain a little bit in case anybody else doesn't know what it is. It's the only, the oldest photography group in the country and it's the only black photography group did i get that part right, right. african-american african-american mm -hmm. right and but it's the oldest photography group in the country which i had no idea about so with that i am going to turn it over to miss colette so she can now give her presentation yeah, yeah, not... and if you're just coming on you we are being filmed we are recording it but we ask that you mute yourself while Colette is making the presentation so we don't hear background noise. Thank you. And um, at the end, we will open it up and you guys can ask questions or um, type in chat if you want, and she'll be able to answer any questions you have. So Colette, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Barbara. This has really been a pleasure um, working with Rockland Center for the Arts and organizing the show. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I just want to say something. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We we especially want to thank um, uh, the Gordon Center for Black Culture and Arts and Sieges Institute for making uh, these exhibits possible, and also Arts Westchester for the Restart the Arts grant. So we're very appreciative of that. And I'm sorry. Now I'm going to turn it back over to you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. Um, 
what I'm what I've done is I've just taken a selection of my works. Um, some of it is in chronological order, not all. Um, and it was really just the way visually I, I sort of put put together the presentation. But I start oh, with my grandmother. This is one of the earliest photographs I took um, in 1975 in Queens. So I'm sort of referring to my notes as I, as I talk to all of you. And she was looking at um, some of my slides in my mother's bedroom. And, um, you know, as a beginning photographer, you know, you're, you're really like, it's, it's, it's a very different kind of experience, like becoming an artist and sort of like growing into your vision. And so it was easier, of course, to start with family members. So I started with my, with my grandmother and she was always very patient. She had a lot of grandkids and she knew we were expected to do all kinds of different things from A to Z. So, you know, she was very cool about letting me photograph her. Um, so at this point, I had a dark room, and I, of course, processed the negatives. I enlarged to prints uh, to four by sixes. And then um, I had a transformation. Um, I started to use some recycled uh, found objects, and um, I was given a metal gasket by a very dear friend of mine who, whose story kind of pops up um, from time to time with my photographs. And it was from a 1948 Dodge. And when I saw the gasket, uh, and you can see it, it's it's just the metal uh, piece that um, becomes a frame for me. And uh, when I saw the gasket, I decided to clean it up a little bit because it was very oily. But I, I really wanted it to kind of stay in that uh, recycled state. And I just did a series on her. You can't see the entire piece, but it's six photographs. And the last photograph, she's looking to the right, and that kind of simulates that she passed by that time. But she was 93, so she lived a really beautiful life and uh, put a lot into each of her grandchildren. Um, the next image, um, I found another gasket. You know, when you have a car, a lot of times you have, <laughs> have to have work done on your car. So I found another gasket, and I was just getting into digital photography and um, trying to get my skills down. And I was also kind of playing around with the scanner. Uh, flatbed scanners had come out. I think the first scanner I had was very, very large and just much too complicated. So I downsized to a smaller scanner. And I also was able to use you know various scanners uh, at the college where, where I worked. And um, so this is an image of uh, Roy Hargrove he was in Tarrytown at the time. I took this in 2001. And my dear friend, uh, the late Stella Mars, who was the head executive director of um, the Martin Luther King Center here in Spring Valley, uh, invited me to go hear him play music in Tarrytown. And she also was a uh, songstress. She was a jazz uh, performer. So she performed and then she introduced Roy. And um, I just remember hearing when he passed, I was very, very sad that, that he passed. And uh, he was just very cool, you know, he was very cool. Another friend of mine, actually the person who took my portrait that started the series, uh, Ronald Harrod, also took pictures of Roy. Um, and at the time, Roy did not have dreadlocks. I think Roy was a little older at that point and he looked very, very different than the photos that I had. Um, um, so this is, I, I kind of went between black and white and color, and I love this particular story. It was taken of a woman named Olga Bloom, and she's a violinist. She uh, was the executive director of an organization called Barge Music, and that was in Brooklyn. So this is about 1975, and uh, my father was doing a portrait of her. Uh, my father is Alex Fournier, and, and we actually feature a one of his... Uh, drawings, one of his uh, illustrations in the Roca show. So that was kind of like really cool that we would be finally showing work together after, you know, so many years and he uh, passed many years ago now. But um, Miss Olga actually had a, a presentation that, that evening. And so she did this classical music with all these musicians on a barge in Brooklyn. And um, she's, you know, since passed, but she, she made Brooklyn, um, 
a very classical place is the best way to, way to put it. So I did a couple of portraits of her, and this was one that I, I printed. Sorry. Um, photographer James Vandersee, this is 1979. Um, and one of the things, I was working with a friend of mine, uh, Malcolm Luck, and I call him Pi, but I was working with Pi, and we were doing a, a series on... Um, called ethnic telecommunications and we actually wanted to do kind of a multi-cultural show so we decided we were going to uh, photograph people in the native community up in Rochester New York Rochester and Buffalo I was living upstate at the time and um, we wanted to do African Americans and Hispanics well the project really just never got off the ground completely because we really didn't have any any budget to kind of get it off the ground but I did get to photograph James Vandersee in 1979. I contacted his wife at the time, uh, Donna Musiden, and she um, made time for us to uh, come to New York and, and photograph him. So that was really, really, really a pleasure. He was quite a gentleman. Um, I knew somewhat of his life. I, I knew that his work had reemerged through uh, MoMA and I think uh, NESCA, New York State Council on the Arts. And so he was sort of uh, rediscovered, if you will, in 1968. And um, when I teach, I make sure that my students know of photographers who very much influenced me, um, such as Gordon Parks and Van Der Zee. Um, and it's just important for them to know that there are African-American photographers out there, if, especially if they're not familiar with them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, I, I try to teach them about Kamonge photographers, the collective that I'm part of, and um, just let them know that, you know, it's a vast world. I think they're more appreciate, appreciate, uh, appreciative of it now than when I first started teaching. When I first started teaching, believe it or not, my students didn't even go into the New York City, you know, which is like an hour away. And it's, you know, so the students have definitely become more sophisticated over the years. And Colette, uh, James Van Der Zee was a, a, a photographer, made famous all the um, musicians and and an elite in Harlem, right? Well, he did a number of things, um, and I think if people don't know him, they should really do do some research. Uh, he also had a sister that was a photographer. He was also um, the main photographer for the Marcus Garvey movement. Um, and so that's where you would see like a lot of the photographs that he took of the women in white and people marching down Fifth Avenue into Harlem. Um, he did weddings. Um, portraits, very, very stunning portraits. Uh, to me, actually, he was one of the first sort of alternative photographers. Uh, he did a very beautiful image, which maybe the next time in the presentation, I'll include the image, but <clears throat> excuse me, he did a very beautiful image of um, a couple who had gotten married, and then he superimposed a child, um, kind of foretelling that he would be that the family would be giving birth to a young child at some point. So he, he was he was very, very extraordinary. He was also a musician. He played with um, the Fletcher Henderson Band, and, um, and he was married twice. You know, he had a wife when he, you know, first uh, got into the business, and then he, uh, after she died, um, then he remarried a much younger woman, Donna Musidin. Um and that kind of recreated his 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 uh, career. Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. <clears throat> um, this is kind of a, a special photograph of mine. Uh, the young man is a a model, and he did some uh, television work. And uh, we all were when I was in Rochester. We were all part of a uh, a group that was kind of an offset of the NABJ. National Association of Black Journalists. So we all kind of came together. We shared ideas. Um, so there were people in television. There were people from um, the print side of the house, magazine, reporters, you know, theater people. Anyway, he came to me with a photograph. I think the ad was in Essence Magazine, if I could remember correctly. And he asked me if I could 
put him in this photograph or recreate this photograph with him in it. So uh, I don't even remember where we shot this. So I don't remember where the piano was. But um, I think the only thing that was different is maybe his shirt was like a little bit too modern relative to the original photograph. But um, everything else, you know, we set up just like just like the photograph, you know, including the lighting. And the only thing I, I added actually was in this area here, I put like a 15 watt bulb that, that would just put a little bit more uh, detail in that shadow area. But I think he was very pleased for, with it. Um, we also did um, photographs uh, for his modeling card. So we did something of him in a business suit. We did something of him more casual. And then this, I believe, was the cover shot on the modeling card. So um, that was fun. That was fun. I did a lot of freelancing in those days. And I was also working for About Time magazine, which I'll mention a little bit later. Um, uh, oh, okay. So, so this is a natural lead, and this is um, <clears throat> 1983. Racism must go, and I was photographing for About Time magazine in Rochester. They were a monthly magazine uh, that went actually out to the African American public. They are still publishing after like. 40 or 50 years or something like that, but now they're publishing online. Uh, and they're publishing quarterly, I believe now, instead of monthly. So um, the staff was always short staff, but they were very, they really did like very good articles, um, really in depth. Uh, so I did their photography and then, you know, sometimes they would use stock and um, so now, at that time, they were black and white. Now they've actually evolved into uh, color. But one of the things about this particular photograph in the whole session was, first of all, it was very far to drive from Rochester to Washington, D.C. <laughs> so by the time we all got there, we were all pretty tired. But um, I know that I had an attitude. So. I said to myself, I'm going to like photograph the kids. I'm going to try to do something that's going to say, make a statement about the young people coming to the march. Because 20 years prior, in, 19, in 1963, they, many of them were not alive. So I said, this is going to kind of be for the kids, for them to see, you know, uh, where, for them to know. And, and obviously, you could see that the kids are, you know, they have their placards and they're marching. Um, but I was just very frustrated that 20 years later, we were still, you know, looking for civil rights. And so that, that kind of, um, that's never really happened to me before, but it happened in this case and it just took my mood in kind of a strange place. Um, I got through it, you know, and then I got home and processed my, my work and was really happy to be there. But I just, you know, there was just this tone, this thing that was just overcame me. And I, but you know, no matter what, you have to keep working and get those assignments done. Okay, uh, this is a photograph I took in uh, Gory Island in Senegal, Dakar, Senegal. And I was very fortunate to make three trips to uh, Dakar, um, at, to Senegal and to Senegambia. Um, I'm just looking for my notes. Uh, yeah, so at this time I was freelancing I still continued to freelance, even though I was working with About Time and I was still teaching a couple of classes. I taught an evening workshop <clears throat> to adults. And then I also taught at the community dark room, which had a beautiful dark room, which I would lo I love to use that particular dark room. But anyway, I was approached by an administrator from the University of Rochester, Dr. Fred Je Jefferson. And he asked me to come on these three trips with a couple of videographers. And they were actually tours into um, uh, Senegal. And uh, we went to, it was so special. I mean, I, I went three times. I went three times and it was just miraculous each time. And I put together from the slides that I had, I was doing mostly slides and also black and white and some medium format. Um, I don't know how I carried all of that stuff, plus a tripod, I really do. Now, now that I think about it, I don't know how I did it. But um, just Gory Island was just absolutely so fascinating and so surreal, 
you know, because I was searching, you know, I, I'd found out about slavery when I was a child. And um, my sister and I were watching a movie um, and she told me, oh, we were once slaves. That's why this man is being treated so badly. And I was like six or seven, five, six, seven, something like that. But I'd never forgotten that. And I just decided I had to find out about Africa and find out why we were slaves. And that's kind of been a, a life journey. Um, so this presentation doesn't reflect that entirely. Um, I've kind of gone, you know, back and forth with the footage. Um, now in 19, I'm sorry, in 2007, I had the opportunity to travel with uh, Chico Wali, African drum and culture. At that time I was doing African, learning African dance. Previous to that, I'd taken dance um, in Rochester, New York with Garth Fagan. Garth Fagan, and that was my first dance ever. I mean, my sister had done African dance. My older sister used to dance. And so this was, I, I was like a fish out of water, but I loved it. You know, I loved the movement because I liked to exercise. Um, so we went to this little community called Bepoise, Ghana. And this is where I met Queen Mother Monica. And she was an administrator basically for um, the uh, Seventh-day Adventist school, which had maybe about 500 children. So I uh, grabbed this photograph of her, not grabbed it, but I composed this photograph of her because I really liked her spirit. She was, she was very sweet, she was very strong. You know, you can feel her strength. Um, and when we went back in 2010, I was able to um, give her a copy of the photograph. And this is Queen Mother of Progress, Miss Alexandrina Dixon, who is the executive uh, director of, Chi of uh, Chico Awali African Dance, Drum, and Culture. I know I'm saying that wrong, but basically you get the idea. Um, who is the most amazing woman. And when we went to Africa the second time, she was uh, being instilled becoming a queen, queen mother of progress. And that's what my show is about right now at uh, Garner Art Center. Um, I have a show up that is actually started, but it actually will be featured, the work will be featured um, this coming weekend, May 21st and 22nd. So we'll have a reception, um, you know, because of COVID, not a huge reception, <laughs> no food. I don't think any water either, but that's okay. <clears throat> the spirit will be there. We'll have some drumming. Um, I'm going to bring my drum and drum with our drummer, Yaya. And um, and then they will, they he and the children will go out to the tent and dance. And then the following day, they'll have a uh, drum and uh, dance workshop. And this is really one of my favorite photographs taken in 2010. And I... I recognize for me, it's a decisive moment. Um, the person on the left-hand side was carrying these little ice packs and everybody else is walking in through the village to go to the Durbar to you know, get a seat in the place. So anyway, if you get to see that show, you'll see more of the photographs that I made from that experience. And I, I just wanna say really quickly, I really welcome everybody. I see a couple of names that I know and I just wanna welcome people and thank them for taking this time to uh, share my photography and hear my words. Uh, very nice photograph that I just really loved on my last trip so far to Ghana. Uh, this was um, uh, in Elmina, the Elmina Castle in the Ashanti re region of Ghana. And this was just a young man that was kind of touring, but the, the importance of it, this is in the women's um, slave area where the women were kept. So I think maybe about 100 women or so were kept in that space. And um, what did I want to say? So during slavery days, um, I mentioned that the women's, I'm sorry, I mentioned that the women, um, or there, was about, there were about 200 women that were you know, kept in the space. And the interesting thing, um, when you see the bricks on the ground, the the Amina Castle was first owned by the Portuguese uh, and then the Dutch and then the British. I think by the time the British actually owned it, slavery was over. But there are parts of the castle and as horrific 
is this castle represents the architecture just really captured my eye the architecture was so fascinating to me that every time i go i found it find a new way to envision and to see it but when it was owned by dutch we were told by one of the tour guides when it was owned by the dutch the dutch had painted the bricks gold so there are parts of the castle where you'll walk and you'll see the gold colored bricks they're really old of course but that's when the Dutch um, castle. Can, can someone mute, please? I don't know whose mic that is, but can you mute, please? Um, okay, so so this is the signature piece. Um, it's called uh, Miss Alma series, and it was taken in West Algiers in 2007. And uh, being part of Kamonge, we had received a grant from OSI to um, uh, the Open Society Institute to photograph post Hurricane Katrina. And we, some of us were photographing in 2006. I had to wait for the money to come to photograph in 2007. But this is a photograph of a lady named Miss Alma. I'm, I'm sorry, it's Miss Alma's mother, actually. Um, and Miss Alma was um, very involved, if you will, um, in the whole cultural scene and anti-racism scene in New Orleans. So I had a chance, I had an opportunity to spend about two days photographing uh, with her family. And that was, I was there for about 14 days in New Orleans, but two of those days were dedicated to photographing her and her family. Uh, this is Annie of Creole Gardens. Uh, Creole Gardens was a place where I stayed in New Orleans. And again, um, if you ever get a chance to see my retrospective, Spirit of a People, I probably show about 10 or 12 photographs from the Hurricane Katrina um, days. So you get more of an in-depth story. But um, this particular woman, Annie, was um, holed up in the I always forget the name of this um, place, but she was really holed up in this in the New Orleans, New Orleans. States, um, the Saints uh, Stadium for several days. And she sat, I mean, for the whole time I was there, I talked to her a lot because she was such a fascinating woman. And she really was a housekeeper, but she told me she would never go to that stadium again because of what she experienced during her, Hurricane Katrina. The and, Superdome um, is the, with the word you're looking you. for. Thank you. It sure is. Thank you very much. In fact, the last time I was in New Orleans, the Superdome was owned by Mercedes-Benz. So I guess they were trying to get a new image. <laughs> well, you know, it's sports, so they'll, they'll find a way to make it work and make people come back. And... Um, uh, yeah, but anyway, so so she had spent time in the super dome. I'm I'm just watching my time because I, I need to get through everything. Uh, this particular series was turned out to be very very successful. It was um, Black Motorcycle. It was a ripple ripple of thunder. The Black Motorcycle series, uh, history of Black motorcyclists in America, and I met a gentleman who was an incredible writer and researcher at About Time magazine, uh, the late Adolf Dupree, but he was just just absolutely just such an amazing, amazing uh, writer. And um, he, he came up to me one day and he says, oh, Colette, we have to collaborate on something. And I love collaborating, I, especially with a writer, another photographer. I absolutely love it. Um, you know, because it really just gets gets your a, a chance to um, put your ideas together, and it's a different look than if you do it yourself. If you do the one person show, of course, I've done a few of those, but once you collaborate with somebody, you, you get something. You get something totally different. <clears throat> anyway, um, we spent about f from 1984 to 1987 uh, doing the series on the black motorcycle riders. And this particular image is a young young motorcycle couple. And then this was an image, um, again, from the same series. I called it Wink, and uh, this was in Detroit, Michigan. So actually, while I was in Detroit, I got to visit some of my father's people, uh, one of his uh, aunts who lived in Detroit at the time. 
and uh, oh, there is something I, I do need to tell you about that. Um, uh, let's see. So the a ripple of thunder, the black motorcyclist in America was cited as one of the best exhibitions of 1987. It was acknowledged as SEPA's winter, in SEPA's winter spring quarterly catalog in 1988. So we actually did two showings of it, two exhibitions, one in 1987 at the Pyramid Gallery, and then the other one in 1988 at the SEPA Gallery in Buffalo, New York. And I have to say, from that experience, I found that my work shows better in a small venue. Um, the first one we did was at uh, Pyramid Gallery, and that was an old church, and the show got shrunk. It really did. I, I was so disappointed. But the second one in SEPA, they had small rooms. We had a motorcycle in the show. We did like a motorcycle wall um, with vests and graffiti and, you know, to, just to really kind of encapsulate the environment. And um, that show was fabulous. I absolutely enjoyed it. It was just beautiful. <laughs> this is I'm One in a Million. Um, it was a self-assignment. Uh, covering the Million Woman March in Philadelphia. And uh, the lady here on the bottom, oh, sorry. Oh, boy. Oh, no. Okay, here we go. But the lady on the bottom holding the sign, her name is Marie Davis. And it really spoke to about 750,000 women who gathered in Philadelphia to uh, focus on their trials, their circumstances, and their successes. It was a day-long march and program. It featured prayer, music, inspirational uh, features, speeches, I'm sorry, uh, at the Liberty Bell. And uh, the march really addressed economic deterioration of the African-American community, the importance of nurturing young children, and also finding a collective voice in politics and civil rights. Uh, next photograph is my muse. <laughs> Uh, Gordon Parks, this was taken in 1985 at the Corcoran Gallery where he was having a one-man show, at, or one-person show. As a teenager, uh, Gordon Parks' autobiography, A Choice of Weapons, became my Bible and gave me the foresight to study and become a professional photographer. Um, this is a series that I had started in grad school attempting to uh, photograph African-American women in the visual arts, which is a series I'm still attempting. Unfortunately, we have a lot of shy African-American women out there who don't always want to be photographed, but I'm still after a few of them. Um, but this is one that I did of Camille Billups uh, in 2003. And then I later um, added fabric and did some scanning to give it, you know, sort of more depth. And I uh, had a wonderful, wonderful visit with uh, Camille. I would only really see her at openings, so this was my chance to do a one-on-one -on -one with her. Um, and as a documentary filmmaker and artist, Camille documented the Black experience with her husband, James Hatch, and they created the Hatch Billups Collection. Uh, this is a Barack Obama inauguration, 2009, January 19th, to be more specific. And uh, this was such a fun time. I, I just can't believe we're in such a different political environment because this was just, you know, we were working with the NAACP. We were working with the uh, Obama Democratic team and knocking on doors and calling people and meeting at a beautiful bookstore in Nanuet, New York called Origins. Um, but it was the, by the time, by the time we bust there, it was like 19 degrees and it was absolutely f frozen. And, um, I just turned around and I just photographed people around me because you really couldn't move anywhere. <laughs> so I just kind of, I captured this particular image, which I, I thought was just really lovely. It really spoke to the moment of history. Uh, this is Trumpet Man uh, in Hollywood, Florida. I made this image in 2021. 20, and the couple in the back, I have images of them dancing to his music, to his jazz music. Um, 
So it was really important for me to include them in the photograph, but I really wanted to focus on him and um, the beautiful way that he dressed and, you know, his, his energy and his cheeks reminded me so much of like Dizzy Gillespie when I photographed uh, Dizzy Gillespie so many years ago. Okay, um, Key to the City, Nelson Mandela, N Nelson and uh, Winnie Mandela, 1991. I photographed this for the Bergen Record uh, in Harlem. And um, it was just a very special occasion to, you know, be there as a photographer photographing Nelson Mandela, who, you know, had been released from prison. Um, and I worked with an organization at Reverend Daughtry's church, House of the Lord Church in Brooklyn. Uh, my girlfriend, Valerie Bell Bay, who's an attorney, got me into the uh, organization and we worked to free, you know, and make people know about Nelson Mandela. Um, so as I worked for different newspapers, they knew I was really into, you know, black history. So they would give me assignments when they were able to, that was, you know, specifically covered black history. And uh, in the photo, uh, you can see uh, Mayor Dinkins to the right and his wife Joyce to the left. Um, now this was kind of, um, this was, this next series of photographs um, were my last photographs taken about two weeks. I actually got stuck in Florida because I got kind of sick and I wasn't, it was a drag, couldn't drive, <laughs> COVID was out. I mean, I was in Florida for like a year and a half and I could not get back home. And I couldn't really photograph very much because I couldn't really get around. Anyway, I happened to meet this young lady. Her name is Chanel Bell. And I happened to meet her literally. I would do these walks every day from my niece's house through this park, through past a pool, and then through this complex next to, next to us. And so it was about maybe like a 20 minute, 25 minute walk I'd do every day as, as often as I could. And I saw this woman throwing out these huge, huge bushes, huge tree leaves. And I said to her, oh, you know, you could just root those and grow them. And she says, well, I'm trying to get rid of them because I have too many of them in my backyard. So we started talking and she just turned out to be the most fascinating young woman. I mean, she was just so much fun. Um, so you can see that she's a seamstress. She orders her, her materials and stuff from uh, India. And then she designs, she does her own makeup. She does her own jewelry. This lady was just um, absolutely amazing. Um, and we spent a day photographing um, and she was easy to direct because she was just really into being photographed. So it was nothing to direct her. You know, I would just maybe ask her to turn a certain way or, but you know, she infused so many ideas into what I was photographing and that just made it such a, a, a wonderful project for me. Um, and this was one of the last ones that, that, that I took of her, um, in her little terrace and I called it Bollywood dancer. So, so she actually goes out to different beaches and she videotapes herself doing her dances in all of the outfits that she puts together, which is part of her, her heritage. And then I decided to make it a triptych. So that's how you'll see it in the Roka show as the three images uh, together uh, representing uh, Chanel Bell. And we're coming to a conclusion. So I want to thank you for your support. Um, this is one of my, also my signature pieces. And I just want to talk about it a little bit. I call it Muslim Women and Child. I photographed it when I was working for the Bergen Record in uh, Patterson, in 1991 and that was that was an experience all on its own working for the Bergen record because we actually covered like 10 counties in um New Jersey including Trenton so every once in a while you had to make that if, if there was something happening in the governor's office you had to make that trip to uh, Trenton um but what I want to say about this the original photograph was a color negative and for, uh, with its various tones, I decided to have it printed in black and white. Um, 
And my original thought was if the newspaper would have used it for Mother's Day, which was like that particular weekend, you know, uh, what we call mu uh, weather, uh, weather art. art. So it's not an assignment. It's just it's just a scene that you see on the street that you connect with and you talk to the person and you get their permission to photograph them. Um, but what was, again, special about it, it's been published in several publications, inclu including my collective Kamoinge Sweet Breath of Life, um, which was an African-American uh, family by Frank Stewart, one of our members, which included poems by Ntozaki Sanj, who's now passed. It was also printed in, um, a published in Reflections in Black, a history of black photographers from 1840 uh, to the present. And then also in an uh, exhibition that I curated in 1993, which was a multi-sided exhibition called There is a World Through Our Eyes, Percep Perceptions and Visions of the African-American Photographer. And again, that was 1993. So I thank you and let's open the floor for questions. And Barbara will do that part. So if you have a question, you can unmute um, yourself and ask. But first, we'll go to the chat because there are two in the chat room. Oh, good. So um, uh, Lisa Saunders says, what a body of work. Thanks for sharing these people Hi, with Lisa. us. Hi, Lisa. How are you? Lisa is a tremendous writer. And she, I've been following, we used to work together in campus communications at Rockland Community College. And she, I, I can, it would take a whole show to tell you her story, but her name is Lisa Saunders. Well, thanks, Colette. It was really, really wonderful to see your work. Oh, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> this is really fun. <laughs> oh my gosh, I really miss you. She, she moved upstate. She, she moved from Rockland to... Um, Baldwinsville, New York, but near, near Syracuse. Yeah, near Syracuse, yeah. So, but she was also... Um, around the Amistad territory. So whenever I would go up to Cape Cod, I'd stop by and Lisa and I would have breakfast or lunch or go for a quick walk with her dog. <laughs> <laughs> and now we can Zoom. Look how comfortable we all are. I love it. Seeing love each it. other on Zoom. <laughs> so did, did you have a particular question? No, I'm just thrilled to see your work. Oh, I haven't you. seen you in a while. <laughs> thank you. So um, somebody asked, would you speak a little bit about the role and honor of the Queen Mother? The images are beautiful. Thank you. Um, it, it's quite complex. Um, she's, she was uh, asked to be the Queen Mother of Progress. And so to my understanding, what she is supposed to be doing is helping the village of Bepoise um, emerge on a more technological level. So that's why she had the relationship with the Queen Mother Monica, who was one of the administrators of the very of the particular school. So, um, you know, again, you really have to see the exhibition. Um, if if you're able to, you really have to see the exhibition at Garner Art Center, because um, I guess there are about maybe 25 photographs and probably 20 are dedicated to um, what they call the uh, Durbar, which was the actual ceremony. And it was about like a four hour ceremony. There was drumming and dancing and speaking. All of the village elders were there. Um, Miss Drina uh, was, made, was covered at some point with the white powder for protection. Um, there was a change of clothing um, yeah, again, you really have to see the show because, you know, that's why I kept that show as a body of work so that people could really understand, you know, the, the background information because it is quite complicated. Um, and actually I have a picture of a woman who was a queen mother of New York City, of Harlem, Audley Moore, and I actually ended up photographing her in... I think it was Syracuse at the women's encampment, someplace upstate New York. Um, so there, and then I just heard there was another queen mother, a very famous lady. I, I don't really know a lot of the, the top musicians today, but Lisa, someone was just made a, a queen mother uh, for the country of Ghana. And she was celebrated in uh, Los Angeles. 
she's a big name, but I don't really know who she is. <laughs> Um, but you know, so it, it is a, um, so she'll be going back and forth, uh, to, to Ghana, which we've been going anyway. And, you know, part of our relationship in Ghana, um, is that we had a drummer, uh, Jerry Descoto, who was our drum teacher and dance teacher. And he was from, uh, Ghana. So when we visited Ghana, we'd stay at his particular compound and, uh, he became, um, very him and his brother became like very religious and built a church in their compound so there are very very interesting relationships going on in ghana we have a lot of friends in ghana now um i can't wait to go back i just wish this covid would go away so that we can just go back to normal because i'm ready to hit the road <laughs> if my health you know holds up i'm ready to hit the road i really am i really miss traveling um so uh, so whoever asked that question, I really hope you'll, if you're local, you'll get to see the show. And then actually, um, the work is also on the Social Documentary Network. It's number 5850 under Colette Fournier uh, with very in-depth ex explanations about the Queen Mother of Progress. Colette, what, um, what, what caused you to do the um, collage with... Um... Salima, because you have a couple of those. Right. Um, I, again, it was it started out as a as a graduate school project uh, where I was doing a a quilt, and I was photographing uh, women, and I was calling it women in the visual, African American women in the visual arts. So I was doing a quilt, but I was having a lot of problems with my sewing machine, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and each semester when we were in grad school, I was in a, a low residency program and each semester we would have six months to work on, you know, each project. So first I had to photograph the women and then I had to um, work them into this particular quilt. So after grad school was over, you know, and I had some, some more time, I started to um, do different things. My, my, my mother was a seamstress and a designer, she covered a couch for me. She used to make our coats, you know, she was totally into it. Um, and so I, I learned how to sew when I was younger. My sister sews beautifully. Um, I was lazy with it, but I still have an interest in fabric and introducing fabric uh, photography into the fabric. And then also just kind of scanning to add more dimension and um, add more more meaning to the work. So that's a, that's an ongoing uh, project. And there are a couple of photographers that are on this Zoom that I'm waiting to photograph <laughs> so I can include you in the project. And it's interesting because you, you just really don't know, you know, I mean, that's why I call most of what I do a series because you don't know, I don't always know when I'm gonna go back to that series to continue it. So for me, it's not ended because I finished shooting it in 2000 or something like that. You know, I may want to pick it up and go back to it. So, you know, with the, with the um, African-American women in the visual arts, I, I really want to photograph more African-American uh, women um, and incorporate them in, into, um, into fabric really just in, incorporate them into fabric with, you know, more of the 3D objects. Does anybody else have a question? You can unmute yourself and ask, or you can type it into chat. Colette, what, um, what projects are you working on now? I'm trying to stay well, <laughs> which is a project in itself. Um, what, am, what am I working on? Well, I just finished um, the Queen Mother of Progress. So, you know, so that's a series. So if I get the opportunity to go back to Ghana, I'll be doing, you know, more shooting there, more photographing. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I finished the book, uh, Moving Through a Photographic World. I'm looking for a publisher. I might have to self-publish, which is totally out of my realm 
Um, but I, I am still looking for a publisher. I talked to About Time Magazine, uh, who really have an excellent staff. I thought I they might be able to help me publish the book. Uh, it's like 25 chapters, and it has about 100 photographs to it. So it was suggested that it be a tabletop. But I, I, I just, you know, it's going to be like a GoFundMe or something because I really don't have the means to um, publish it. And I really had no idea that publishing was so expensive. But I did work with the editor. I'm indexing the book. So that's, um, and I, actually I'm told that there's, there are freelance indexers who I might take advantage of one of their services to, to get that part indexed. Um, I'm pretty sure I have the cover f photograph for the front and back. And, you know, that's a huge project. You know, still teaching. Um, I'm going to be doing something. Um, I'm, I'm doing the retrospectives, which I, I hope to do at ROCA at some point, in addition to, you know, workshops. Um, the retrospective spirit of a people is, I just love doing it because it's like an hour and a half presentation. And I cover four uh, particular areas, series, um, my community, the post-Hurricane Katrina, the West African series, and um, the Amistad. So I cover four particular uh, areas. And um, it's just, it's really a powerful, I feel it's a powerful presentation. It gives me a lot of energy to show it and talk about those experiences. And... Um, and you just never know what people have to add, you know, to your, your, you know, they may have been there. They, we actually had the Amistad come to Rockland County twice and twice I worked on, on those projects with the Amistad coming to Rockland. Um, <clears throat> but I'm sure that there are other things I'm working on. Uh, for Kamange, we've got a show coming up for Juneteenth and that's in Metuchen. At a <clears throat> excuse me, at a gallery in Metuchen, New Jersey. Um, what else is going on? Oh, um, I'm submitting some work to a book that Deb Willis is, is working on. Um, so I'm in the middle of uh, doing scans for those, and um, I don't know, you know, just trying to read. I'm part of a book club, and you know, I'm I'm active in my community here in Rockland County. So there's a lot definitely going on here. You know, I'm with Ch Ch Chico Awali, so I'm, I'm trying to get back to dancing. I'm drumming. So I'm hoping to actually drum this weekend during the uh, drum session with our drum master, uh, Mr. Yaya. And um, just trying to keep it moving, you know, just really trying to keep it moving, trying to downsize so I have more space for my work. Um, that's an issue. <laughs> I just want to read you some of um, the comments. I don't know if you can see them on your end, but Cynthia Cook mm -hmm. said, thanks, Colette. Wonderful photographs, informative. Um, Barbara Williams said, thank you for sharing this impressive body of work. Well done. I'm going to... Thank you, Barbara. Um, this person's name, Quida. Oh, Quida. Rita. Rita. Thank you, Colette. Great body of work. Good night. Arlene said, Carlette, you are so awesome. And I will always look forward to your amazing exhibits. I always take away so much. I'm in a shared space, so I'm not able to speak to you. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's really, really, really just wonderful hearing people's voices. And, you know, and, and, and what happens is when you've been in your career, like for 40 years, and you've traveled, you know, a lot of people. <laughs> So yeah, it's quite a challenge to keep up, up with everybody. But um, Sandy Fuji said, I'm always moved by your work and presentations. Love getting to know you in a deeper sense each time. Oh, hi, Sandy. She's in my drum class along with uh, Christine, Christina. So we do drum together on Zoom. <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> so does anybody else have any questions for Colette? Don't be shy. Yeah, I'm happy to to um, <clears throat> add more perspectives about photography. It it's such an interesting photography is in such an interesting space right now, 
And, um, you know, especially like what so many of the young people are doing. And then also what the the older people are doing in terms of um, just transitioning. A lot of people are doing books. So many people that we all know, that we all came up together and know each other from over the years. So many people are doing books now and just, you know, really incredibly. It's just, you know, it's something that you don't retire from. You just, you know, you keep moving with the art. Um, you, you keep kind of reinventing, if you will, you kind of keep reinventing the art um, because that's the kind of platform it is where you can do whatever you want to do. And, you know, with digital, it certainly opens up a whole other, other world. And, you know, because I've had so many jobs, <laughs> You know, I'm I'm part um, South American, if you will. My folks are from Guyana, and anyway, there's a there's a cultural thing where like you work a lot and you have a lot of jobs. <laughs> but but you know, so you're used to working, and you know, sometimes you you work through the night if that's what you have to do. You put on some good jazz and you just sort of work through the night. And um, I'm just, I'm very excited about the future of Kamonge. I've been involved with the um, collective since uh, 2001. So I actually came in when I started grad school. So that was a little bit of a challenge to make wow. those meetings and, you know, be in grad school also at the time. Um, but, you know, I found that necessary and I also especially if you want to teach, if you want to, you know, be on that particular level, I really push my students to uh, consider graduate school, especially as early as they can. Because for me, I waited like a long time before I went, but, you know. Somebody asked if, um, if you have any, if you had any difficulties going from film to digital. Yes and no. <laughs> um, well, what actually happened is that I was working for the college um, and I made that transition in 2005. So I was also, I had, over, I had also, I, was, I worked when I first came to Rockland, I was on staff at the Journal News. Then I went to the Bergen Record. And um, after I went to the, left the Bergen Record, I went to Rockland Community College. So that's where I first started teaching, and then that's when I got into communications, the com communications department. Um, so I was asked to come back to the Journal News just to freelance on the weekend. So, you know, I was always happy to do that. It was extra money, and it was, you know, fun making photographs in the county. And um, they were going, they were starting to move into digital. So as a freelancer, if you will, as a freelancer, we weren't going to get digital cameras. We had to provide our own. So that kind of ended the job freelancing with the journal news. But I realized the importance of making that transition. So I actually sold my darkroom equipment to a student who was interested in setting up a darkroom. And I started working for the Post on the weekends. <laughs> so, and the Post play, paid very well. And they were still shooting black and white film. So what I would do is just whenever those checks came in from the post, I had a, 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 an account set aside for my digital camera. And I got my first uh, Canon EOS digital camera in 2005. Maybe it was 2006 by then. So, but what, what now it was my responsibility to create a digital photography department for the college, because that's the way the industry was moving. So I took some classes, which I continue to take classes. You know, I learned some Photoshop, which I'm still not near where I want to be with the Photoshop. Um, and, you know, we were shooting everything uh, digital. And that was huge to keep up with everything we shot, edit it, um, archive it. It was, you know, it was a lot. It was really, really an incredible amount of work because I was working by myself at least on, you know, on that. And then I was still doing other things, um, such as special events and, you know, writing press releases and that sort of thing. So, you know, overall, it was a great experience. You know, I'm still in the classroom, so I can still um, teach students as much as I know um, and find out what they know because they're just incredible. 
they are just absolutely mind blowing really they they know what they want they're multi talented they're not afraid to market they're not afraid to start their own businesses they're just absolutely incredible i love them all <laughs> they're wonderful they they really are but you know i just see more travel um happening um barbara williams and i have a a special project that we're trying to uh, work on as soon as I'm well enough to do it. Um, so, you know, there's, there's so many things. There are things happening in the community. They're certainly worth uh, documenting. Um, you know, you don't have to go far. As long as you have that camera with you, you don't have to go far to, to make images. They're everywhere. You just have to be able to see. And that was the thing I saw in Florida. That's really just opened up you know, for me that, oh, it's like, wow, you know, your eyes, your, your eyesight, you're just getting stronger, your eye is getting stronger. And that was so exciting, especially because I wasn't able to do a lot of photography. So when I was able to do some, I just, it was just miraculous. It's, it's really a gift. It absolutely is, is a gift. You know? Oh, thank you for all thank that. You. Michelle said she wanted to tell you she loved everything you submitted, enjoyed drumming and dancing with you, and, and she'll see you tomorrow. Yes, she will. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank so I just, you. I want to thank everybody for, um, for joining us tonight and thank Colette for your um, wonderful presentation. And if you haven't seen the exhibit, please come because it is really beautiful. Oh, Barbara did an incredible job. I, I told her, this is the best I've seen my work, the way you hung it. It just really shines, you know. Just, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and it's up It's up through June 11th, um, and, and it's open Mondays through Saturdays, 11 to 4. Um, you, you know, drop by any time. And there's also the Charles White Influences show. So Charles White Influences is double. also on at the same time. Yeah. Yes. It's a double treat. <laughs> it is. And I, I think, you know, it, it, it's not something that you're going to see just anywhere right now. So mm -hmm. it's, I think it's a treat for the Hudson Valley to have it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm telling everybody about it. And I, I just hope people just make the time to come and see the show. Yeah. Are there, are there any evening hours or are the, I think the Emerson Gallery closes at five. Is that it closes, Yeah, it closes at four, at but four. you know, so yeah, there's really not any evening hours, but if there's a group that wants to come, okay. um, they can talk to us about it. Okay. Yeah. Very, very good. Okay. So thank you everybody for coming and um, we hope to see you at ROCA. Thank, Thank you for your presentation. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Stay safe, everybody. Okay. Oh, that's great. Okay. That's people, call it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Excellent, excellent. Okay. I'm going to tune out. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thanks, Barbara. Bye-bye.